For many 12-steppers, chapter 4, We Agnostics, is where permission to rename God and redefine a higher power comes from. But that's as far as they go, and some of them continue to object to the language used in 12 steps. But is the language really a deal breaker, or is it just a sign of unmet expectations? Whether you rename God Zeus or nature, creative intelligence, or the universe, we're still ultimately talking about a super being or an all-powerful entity. We're still talking about God. Shakespeare said it best, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In other words, no matter what we call it, what matters is what it is, not its name. In the end, God is God. Nothing wrong with that, as long as that's what you believe, but how about those who don't? Have you ever sat in a meeting and listened to someone describe what they call a God moment? People become very invested in seeing things through a lens that allows them to make sense of what they're seeing. The light turning red that gets them to stop and thus avoid the collision becomes a God moment. Running into an old friend who says something helpful becomes a God moment. Choosing to go left at the intersection instead of right and finding that story you knew was around somewhere becomes a God moment. This is how human brains are wired to find connections in things around us. And our penchant for doing so means we sometimes make connections where there aren't any connections. Again, this isn't always a problem. Many people are helped by making these connections. But here's the other side of that. When a toddler learns a new word, let's say cookie, you can pretty much guarantee that for a time, everything the toddler sees will be called cookie. God moments can be cookies too. If it's the only way you know how to explain something, then the same explanation is used for everything that cookie's a God moment, this cookie's a God moment, etc. This brings us back to chapter 4. On page 47, the author writes, When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies, too, to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. That's a powerful and inclusive message for the fellowship, but we're still talking about cookies. We're still talking about God. An agnostic version of the same message might read, when therefore we speak to you of God, we mean that our experience looked to us like a God moment. It may look like something different to you. This applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let our assumption that God was involved in our awakening unwittingly force you to believe the same must be true for you. Find your own cookie. Now, you may be wondering what ganders have to do with all of this, so here we go. The old saying goes like this, What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Its original meaning was, What's good for a female goose is also good for a male goose, known as a gander. Its more common meaning today is, what's good for you is probably good for me too. Let's acknowledge that Bill Wilson saw his experience the way he saw it, and sincerely wants us to reap the same benefit he did. Can we let him see it the way he saw it? Can we? Or do we have to object to how he saw it, and in objecting to his experience, make our own experience more difficult? He's giving us permission to rename and redefine. Can we extend the same open-mindedness to him by allowing him to use language that fit his experience? And speaking of open-mindedness, do you realize that Wilson didn't want to rename God? He didn't want to use a phrase like power greater than ourselves. He wanted God to be God. When people are convinced that serendipity or coincidence is actually God, there's no changing their mind about it. He had had a God moment, and everything was a cookie now, damn it. But cooler heads prevailed. 
one of whom was AA's resident atheist, Jim Burwell, who stayed sober without God and irritated Wilson to no end by doing so. And today we know that God isn't required for recovery, though a change in perspective certainly is. Wilson's open-mindedness opened the door to a lot of people. Can we extend the same open-mindedness to him as well? If we pull back a little and look at what Wilson believed he experienced without a God filter, we could say Wilson had a moment of clarity about the nature of life and how his approach to it wasn't working. His need for control and having people to do what he wanted them to do was destructive, not productive. Looked at that way, his development of a program centered on learning how to let go of things we can't control is understandable, whether God's involved or not. He had what he believed to be a God moment. If we do the same work, we'll get the same benefit, and we can claim it was whatever we believe it was.